okay, the kids from second grade and under can go, no children's church today. <laughs> kids second grade and under stay and help those that are older than you understand <laughs> what's going on. Uh, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. The title of the sermon today is The Dash in Between, and you probably understand what I'm talking about when I say that. If you go to a cemetery and look at a tombstone, you'll see a born date, a dash, and a died date. We're going to talk about that dash that is in between. We're going to look at the birth of Jesus. You're going to need your Bibles today. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. We're going to be in Luke. We're going to be in Jeremiah. And we're going to be in Psalms today. As we look at what goes on in between the time that we are born and the time that we die. And as we look at it today, we'll look at Jesus in the beginning and then again at the end. But then we're going to look at ourselves as well. We're going to see that Jesus was born for a specific purpose. And we're also going to see that God has a specific purpose for you as well. And he had that even before we were ever born. God had already determined what we were to do. He had already determined all the things about our lives. Now, the problem is, God has determined it. But probably most of the time, we never sought God's will. We only did what we wanted to do, did the things in life we wanted to do, married the people that we wanted to marry. And maybe we might have prayed and said, Lord, is this right? But it really didn't matter whether he said it or not because we had already made up our mind that that's the way that it was going to be. So we're going to look at this period of time between birth and death and see what can we do with the time that God has given us. And even though most of us are older, our lives aren't over yet. And maybe we've made some wrong turns. Maybe we're in a wrong turn right now. But does that mean that everything's over? Does that mean that God's through with us, that God can't use us anymore? No. So stand with me as I read. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. We look usually on Christmas, look at the angel announcing Jesus' birth to Mary, and we are going to go there. But we're going to look at Matthew right now, and uh, Jesus, or the birth being announced to Joseph. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to, 
to you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus means the Lord saves. For he will save his people from his sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth their, her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you today, Lord God, we give you all honor and glory for loving us, for sending Jesus and his suffering for us, dying for us, being resurrected so that we could follow after in the resurrection of the dead. And we just praise you today that we have this opportunity to study your word and to be obedient to you as the Holy Spirit convicts us and draws us later to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go back over to Luke. You're just a couple of uh, books over. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And chapter 1 of Luke. And we're going to look at the announcement of the birth of Jesus to Mary. Beginning in verse 26. Now the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her, who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In both of these birth announcements, Joseph was told that he would be a savior to the people. That he would save his people from their sins. Mary was told that he would be a ruler and that he would reign forever 
on the throne of his father David. And that both of them were told that his name would be Jesus, the Lord saves. Now, a little bit of background on this. When we read the account in Matthew, Joseph had just found out, probably a few days, a week, two weeks, that Mary, his betrothed, they were engaged. But during that period of time, an engagement was almost like a marriage. Joseph, if the engagement was to be broken, it would have to be broken by a divorce. Not just say, I don't want to marry you anymore. It's over. They would have to obtain a divorce to break the betrothal, the engagement. If you remember, I've talked to you about this before uh, when Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in the Father? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. This is part of the betrothal, the activities that go on. When a man and a woman became betrothed, engaged, the spouse-to-be would go back to his father's house and he would prepare a bridal suite for his wife to come to when they got married. That's what Jesus is saying. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus also said when he was asked, when are you coming back? said, I don't know. Only the Father knows the day and the hour that I will come back. You see, the young man couldn't run home and throw a room together, a bridal suite together, and say, this is good enough, now I'm going to go get my bride, and we'll have the wedding ceremony, and then we can go on into the bridal suite. No, during that time, the father had to approve of the bridal suite that the groom built. And the groom was only allowed to go back and get the bride when the father said, Son, go get your bride. And when they went, it was normally at midnight. He would send a wedding party ahead. He would send someone ahead to blow the trumpet so that they could hear that they were coming and they could be ready. So when the bridegroom came, the bride would go back with him. That's a picture of the rapture of the church to go back with the Lord Jesus Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb and the consummation of the marriage between us and Jesus Christ. Well, this was what was going through Joseph's head. We're engaged. Mary's got pregnant. And it's not my baby. Mary had already known it. She had gone to her cousin Elizabeth's house. John the Baptist was in Elizabeth's womb. Remember that? He leaped for joy when Mary came into the house because the Messiah, the Savior, was in Mary's womb. Well, she came back told Joseph, I'm pregnant. Now Joseph could have done three things. The first thing he could have done was have her stoned to death. Because a woman caught in the act of adultery would be stoned to death. And even though they weren't married, they were betrothed and it took a divorce to dissolve that betrothal. He could have had her stoned to death. No doubt, she's got a baby. Something's had to happen. 
Another thing he could have done, he could have thrown a big fit about it and said she was an adulteress and sought a divorce to get free from her. But the Bible says he was a just man. And he pondered this. He didn't want her stoned, killed. He didn't want to make a big spectacle out of it and let other people put her down and all these other things. He was thinking, how can I go about this and do it secretly so that no one will ever know that it came about? But while he was pondering it, the angel came, probably the same angel that came to Mary, Gabriel, and said, Joseph, the child that Mary is having is God's son. The Holy Spirit came upon her and she conceived. It's not some other man. She's not been unfaithful to you. But it is God's son. Now, think about this for a minute. Joseph, the Bible says, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her until after the baby was born. Mary, a teenage girl, a virgin, the angel said to her, you're highly favored of God. You're going to have a baby, Mary. How can this be? She wasn't arguing. She was asking a question. How can this be? Since I have never known a man. And the angel again told her that the Holy Spirit would come upon her and she would conceive. And she accepted that. And Joseph accepted that. Believing what God had to tell them. Now this had never happened before and it's never happened since. This is a virgin birth. But they believed it and they followed and were obedient to God. Now what I want us to look at, He shall save His people from their sins. He shall rule from His father David's throne forever and ever. This is what Jesus was here for. This is why he was born, and it would be why he would die and then be resurrected from the grave. And we will finish by this message by looking at that. But is Jesus the only person that has ever been born for a specific purpose in life? No. How many people have ever been born with a specific purpose in life? Every single person that has ever been born. Go back to the Old Testament to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, and beginning in verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, 
for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord God. He said to Jeremiah, Before I formed you, I knew you. Before I formed you, I ordained you. I sanctified you. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah, before you were ever thought about, I already had a specific plan for you, for your life. Now go over to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And we use these verses in Psalm and Jeremiah a lot of times about abortion to show that from the moment of conception that is a living human being. From the very moment of conception. Not the day after, but the very moment. Nothing else ever has to happen for that to end up being a living human being. It's already, the process is already started. Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were they all were written. The days fashioned before me, when as yet there was none of them. You knew me before you formed me. My days were written in your book, when as yet there were no days for me. What's David saying? God had a specific plan for his life. Now, I don't believe that Jeremiah and David are special cases. I believe they are representative of all of mankind. Now, most people would say, I don't have any idea what God wants me to do. I don't have any idea what God's will is for my life. But yet, according to the Word of God, we can see that God not only has a will, a plan for your life, He has a specific plan for your life. Before you were ever thought about, Millions of years before you were ever thought about, God had a perfect will for you and your life. Now think about this, young people. Think about it. God already has the person picked out for you to marry. You've got to seek God's will in finding that right person. God's already got an occupation chosen for you. You've got to seek God's will to find what that occupation is. And you know what else you need to do? 
You need to do your best to make straight A's in school. (laughs) Say, well, I don't plan on going to college. You may not. Not everyone needs to go to college. There needs to be people in the trades. And some of them make a whole lot more money than the people that go to college make. But, you may be thinking right now that I don't want to go to college, but later on you find out that it was God's perfect will for you to be a doctor. Medical schools don't take D's or C's. You need better than that. What I'm saying is, be prepared. Whatever it is that God wants you to do, there's nothing wrong with being a smart whatever. Just not a smart aleck whatever. (laughs) God's got a perfect will for you. Now where we get all messed up is there is a perfect will and there is a permissive will that God has for us. Hallelujah for permissive will, right? Not necessarily. Because you see, and I missed it. I missed it for years in my life. And you know, I can, people can tell me and say, yeah, but God can take those years and make something out. Yes, God can do that, but God could have done a whole lot better if I'd have followed His will from the very beginning knowing what God wanted to come about in my life. And so could he be with you as well. So those of us that are older, maybe we have followed God's perfect will for our lives. Maybe we're exactly where God wants us to be, married the exact person that God wanted us to marry, and took the exact job that God wanted us to take, and everything has gone so well in our lives because we have been in the perfect will of God. But me and possibly you are somewhere in the permissive will of God. Didn't do everything that God wanted us to do. You see, I knew when I was a junior in high school that God was calling me into the ministry. And that was the one thing that I did not want to do. And I didn't do it. I was 33 years old, I think, when I quit the Virginia State Police and went into the ministry and went to Bible college, storefront church, all that stuff. I was 33 years old before I finally surrendered. Now, I can try and find God's perfect will for my life now, but there are years that were wasted, and they were wasted because I should have been doing what God called me to do all that time. Now, I can't go back and change that. I can't change one minute, one second of that time. But I can take the rest of that dash that I'm here on this earth and try and find out what is it, Lord, that you want me to do? What do you want with a, from me for the rest of my life? God may be calling you into some kind of mission work. You say, well, God doesn't call old people. Yes, He does. Maybe not full time, short time. God calling you to work You know, I have no doubt about it that God is calling some of you, not just women but men, to work with the children in extended Sunday school and children's church and maybe a teacher or two 
for Sunday school. And you even know who you are. And the Holy Spirit's showing you that. That's God's will. That you do that. And you go find Lois. Where's, I saw Lois. What, right there's Lois. You go find Lois sitting right over there and you tell her, I'm that one of those people. Because you need to do what God's calling you to do. You need to find God's will in your life. And do it. Young people, and I know this isn't the birth of Jesus, but let me tell you something. Don't blow it. Don't blow it. You've got an opportunity while you're still young to get your life started right. You start making bad decisions, bad choices, and taking second, third, and fourth best with your life, you're going to have a hard time getting it straightened out later. And some people never get it straightened out later. You've got that dash, that period of time that God has given you. Use it. For the glory of God, use it so that you can... You know, if your job is painting houses, plumbing, electric, doctor, teacher, nurse, whatever, if your job is mowing the grass, if that is God's will for you, then that is the very best thing for you. And you do it for the glory of God. Because you're doing it for Him. Now let's look at the dash in Jesus' life. Joseph was told that he would save his people from their sins. Mary was told that he'd be a ruler and that he'd reign on his father David's throne forever and ever. Jesus fulfilled his purpose in life. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, I can do nothing other than what I see my Father doing. I'm going to take a stab here. I think John 5, 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees his Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Now, where was the permissive will in Jesus' life? The only thing that was permissive about that is he chose to be in God's perfect will. I can't do anything. If I don't see that the Father's doing it, I'm out of it. But if I see it's something that the Father's doing, I'm joining him in what he's doing. So we think about Jesus and we, you know, it's only the last three years of Jesus' life that we're in the ministry, so approximately 30 years old. What about the years before that? Wasn't he a rambunctious boy and getting in trouble all the time? No, he was perfect. Never sinned during his entire lifetime. And whatever he did was what he saw the Father doing. Now I understand that he was God incarnate. That he was God in the flesh. 
that he was God that came in the form of a baby and grew and gave his life on Calvary's cross so that we would be forgiven of our sins. I understand all of that. But I also understand that he was man as well. And as man, he could have chosen to be disobedient to God. But he never did it. He is our Savior. He came to pay the penalty for our sins. See, when Jesus came and went to Calvary's cross, it wasn't just to die for us. He became sin. He became my sin. All of my sins, all of your sins, all of everyone that's ever lived or will live, sins were placed upon him on Calvary's cross. And he paid the penalty for them. He died for them. Now, this I've heard from a couple of teachers came up in Sunday school two or three weeks ago. Did Jesus go to hell when he died? Let me tell you something. Physical death is a consequence of sin. Spiritual death, separation from God in a place called hell, is the spiritual death. He paid the penalty. Yes, he descended into Hades, the punishment section of Hades. But hell could not hold him. And he broke forth. And he is in heaven right now, preparing a place for us who have accepted him as their Lord and Savior to come, to worship him, to praise him for all eternity. When we get in all these things about what we're going to be doing in heaven, fishing and playing golf and shopping and all these other things, I don't think you're going to want to get up off of your knees from in front of the Lord Jesus Christ and praising Him. I don't think the thought's going to go through my mind, I'd like to go hit a hole in one, or 20 or 30. I think it's all going to be about Jesus and our glorifying Him when we get to heaven. Let me tell you something today. The only way you can go to heaven is through Him. Because if we go back to the verses I quoted a while ago, Thomas said to him, Lord, where are you going? And how can we get there? Jesus said, the way you know. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me. Are you going to heaven today? You can't go just because you're good. You can't go just because you belong to a church, because you've been baptized. You can't go because you give a good amount of money to the church. You can only go when you ask God to forgive you of your sins and invite Jesus to come into your life to be your Lord and your Savior. That's the only way you can go. That is the dash in Jesus' life. I came to save those that are lost. And he's still saving. Paul wrote to the Romans that the wages of sin 
is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God, if you haven't already gotten into them, probably most of you have Christmas trees. And you got gifts in under the trees. And tonight or in the morning, you're going to give them to whoever. And they're going to be excited tearing paper, especially if they're children in the house. Tearing the paper and being excited for an hour or two about whatever they got. It's a gift. It's given to them by someone else. Friend, Jesus is standing here this morning and he's saying, I've got a gift for you. This gift is forgiveness of sin. This gift is a home in heaven with me for all eternity. It's a gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here it is. Jesus is offering it to you, the greatest gift you will ever receive in your entire life, forgiveness of sins and eternal life with him in heaven. There's something about a gift he can offer it to you, but it's not yours until you receive it. And you come today and say, Pastor Mike, I want to receive the gift of eternal life. One of our deacons is going to pray with you and show you what you need to do to be forgiven of your sins and receive the gift of eternal life but you need to receive it today. And we're going to sing a song in a moment, Trust and Obey. And if you've never invited Jesus to come into your life to be your Lord and your Savior, then this morning is the time that you need to do that. Maybe you're here and you need to rededicate your life. You've missed out. God still has a perfect will for the rest of your life. It's not over. You just got to find it and then live it out. Come and rededicate your life today. Pray and just say, Lord God, what do I need to do? Show me. Maybe you're here and you're not a member of Brown Road, but the Holy Spirit shown you that this is where you need to come to worship and serve him at and you want to join today then you come Father as we come to you this morning I thank you and praise you so much for all that you're doing I pray there will not be one person walk out of these doors today who has not received Jesus as their Lord and their Savior I pray, Father, that not one will leave that needs to rededicate their life that's not done it today, and that you will be glorified through every decision that's made. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So as we stand and sing, trust and obey, you